My name is Gunnar Branson, and I love real estate. Real estate is my life. It's all of our lives. It is the collective impulses and desires and needs of all of us expressed in the world around us, in the environment, the built environment, an environment that is almost invisible to all of us because it's everywhere. It's where we live, it's where we work, it's where we play. And if you learn how to read what is happening in real estate, you can start to understand a little bit better about what we are doing as a people, as a civilization. And by understanding what we're doing, you can start to anticipate the future. All very exciting. <laughs> I know, I know. You were really, really excited about the commercial real estate talk that was at the end of the TED conference. Again, I apologize. But it is much more interesting than you think it might be. In order to explain a little bit about how you can read real estate and about how you can understand that actually real estate is about to go through one of the most incredible changes it has experienced since 1450, I'm going to have to go back a little bit and tell you a little bit of theory. So again, forgive me, I know the cocktail awaits. Back in 1968 or so, Gaston Bachelard, a philosopher, wrote a book called The Poetics of Space. And I apologize to anyone here who is French for my bad pronunciation. He wrote about something called desire lines. And quite simply, desire lines are the lines we leave behind us as we go through the world, as we make the world work for ourselves, as we do the things that we want to do. We leave a line behind us. And we've all seen them. We all know exactly what they are. We've all seen in a park, in a college campus, desire lines. These are the paths that we leave in the grass, right? Where everyone's taking a shortcut to get to where they're trying to go. What I love about desire lines is they will not be resisted. Have you ever noticed a desire line where they take a big rock and they put it right in the center of the desire line? And then you have two desire lines. <laughs> it drives architects crazy because they make these beautiful paths made out of concrete and stone and crushed gravel that we're all supposed to travel in geometric patterns between buildings. We love geometric patterns, don't we? We all love going down the lines of our architectural fantasies. Well, after this idea was developed, a lot of smart architects have started to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to build those anymore. I'm just going to create an entire campus of buildings, and then I'm going to put grass everywhere in between them, wait a year, and then put my path right where people want it to be. That's called following a desire line. And when you have a deep, big, muddy path, that's a big path. A lot of people are traveling there. When you have a light one, you create a little footpath. Quite simple. Reading desire lines, once you learn how to do it, is actually the easiest thing in the world to do because what you're doing is looking for the tracks that we leave behind us. Now, this has been done to great effect on things big and small, on desire lines that we're leaving around us all the time. I want you to think about a particular place of desire that we've talked a lot about today. Music. Cast our minds back, way back to ancient times. Oh, I don't know, 2000. When we listen to music on discs, and before that, records. Remember records? Vinyl. Old school, right? Well, something happened. And that was that someone really smart realized that there was a desire line in play. And that was that we were not buying albums. We were not buying records or CDs. We were buying songs. And you all know this story. We all like to look down our noses at those idiots at Warner Brothers or uh, Sony Music. And oh, how foolish. They didn't understand the internet was coming. Well, they've been selling a lot of records for a long time. They were a lot smarter than us. They were a lot richer than us. They sold, uh, back in 2000, total sales of CDs, cassettes, and vinyl was somewhere just shy of $37 billion worldwide. $37 billion. If I am making $37 billion a year, I must be right. And look at all the record demand that there is. And the record demand keeps coming. There's so much demand for records. No, there is demand for songs. And iTunes came out and within five days sold a million songs and then 200 million within a year, one and a half billion by the summer of this year. And they took half the business away. Half in less than 10 years. If that doesn't scare anyone who's selling anything, it should. 
Because the instant that you are selling something different from what people are buying, you are vulnerable. Because desire will always win. We will always make things work for ourselves. And a problem and a question that I've been asking in commercial real estate for a long time is that we sell square footage. So whether you are buying space for your coffee shop or you're buying an apartment or a home or you're buying office space, you're actually looking for something that you need. You need very much. You need a space in order to do the things that you do. And all we're selling in real estate is square footage. We tell you how much it costs per square footage. We tell you how much square footage. And yet, somehow, you're making that space work for yourself. And it's marvelous, I think, the way that we adapt this imperfect thing called square footage into something that we somehow approximate life with. It's an exciting kind of way that we are selling the wrong thing and people are buying another. So, what is going on? How are we living that is not necessarily jibing with our current real estate? A lot of you are familiar with Moore's Law. There's a lot of very intelligent people who are much smarter here than I am. There's something called Moore's Law that came about when uh, Dr. Moore realized that every 18 months there seemed to be a doubling of transistors on a single chip. And that kept happening. At first, back in the 1960s, there weren't that many so it didn't seem like much, and it wasn't really impacting all of us in the room. But by the time we got to the 90s, it was impacting all of us because we were packing more and more chips, or transistors on each chip, and we were able to do amazing computer power with a very low amount of cost and low amount of space. So we had computers, we had the internet. All these things started developing in the 90s. And then we went mobile. And suddenly, we all have in our pockets enough capacity to run the Apollo space program. I know that's a funny little kind of weird metaphor, but it's kind of true. There's a lot of memory sitting inside every one of your pockets. And in there is an amazing amount of stuff, because along with Moore's Law, guess what's happening? We're transitioning from atoms to electrons. And the difference in size between an atom and electron is, might as well be the difference between the sun and the moon. There's so much difference in space. And let me illustrate a little bit about how that could impact us. Any of you remember getting out of college? Did you have a record collection? Did you? Uh, those of us that are old like me, record collections, book collections. Any of you have book collections? Okay. How much of your apartment, remember that first wonderful apartment you had? How much of that do you think you took up with books and records? A third, generally, depending on how acute you were and how much stuff you collected. In other words, we're not living in our space. A third of our space we're using to hold our stuff. And what happens when your stuff all fits here? People in their 20s are buying more than we did, but they're also buying less. It all fits into one of these. It's amazing. Uh, you know, a lot of people I know that own uh, and manage apartment buildings are amazed at how fast People in their 20s are moving. When I was in my 20s, remember moving? The amount of beer you had to give people and pizza just to help you move? All your crud? They move in an afternoon. Oh, am I packed? I guess I'm packed. <laughs> so these are going away. They're all fitting into this. Interesting thing is happening. The average apartment floor plan, this is what it looked like five years ago. Here's what the new ones are looking at now. We're taking about 100 square feet of space out of apartments. By the way, this apartment rents for more money, <laughs> and it's a much nicer place. It just has less room for all that stuff. And people are not buying it on a per square footage basis. Notice, I'm a real estate guy, so I'm saying 578 square feet. But the person buying it is buying a beautiful bedroom an incredible living room and a very small kitchen because I don't cook, really, and I don't want to pay for it. But I do get an incredible lounge downstairs. The new apartment buildings that are being built, by the way, they're not being built in Chicago because our economy is still recessed here. But in Washington, D.C., where there's lots of government money, these kinds of buildings are going up, apartment buildings for young people, and what they're doing is they're putting a boutique hotel environment. And where are people living? They're living in the lobby. That's where they're watching TV, on their pad. That's where they're reading a book. That's where they're listening to music, together. 
because an interesting thing is happening in real estate because it's an interesting thing that's happening amongst people. We are getting smaller and we are getting closer. All these doomsayers that say that these digital devices are making us antisocial, it's making us more social because it allows us to connect to more people, more things, more ideas than ever before with less space. And space, you see, costs money. That's why we all moved out to the suburbs so we could get more space to put our stuff. But if we're in the city with no stuff, we have the same amount of space. And now we get to be with people. And people are where we get the ideas, like in this meeting right here. People are where we get excited. We like being with each other. It excites the neurons. It gets us going. It allows us to live and express ourselves in ways we never could before. Offices, the same thing is happening. The typical office lease for a law firm today, over the last three years, has been a third less than it was 10 years ago. In other words, a third less space per person, per lawyer, than ever before. Now, this is important because lawyers are really boring and very predictable. And lawyers like big, expensive office buildings. In fact, most of the money made in our big cities today is made off of law firms. God bless them. <laughs> but here's the problem. The reason lawyers took all that space is they had big libraries filled with law books. Now they have one shelf with law books so they can be shown on video with the law books behind them. <laughs> they use a database. So a third of their space was taken up by books that are now gone. Every time they're signing up for a new lease, they're getting rid of that space because it's just very expensive insulation. Remember these? You know, for fun, okay, just for fun. Next time you're in an office, a really fancy office, go by and just start looking inside the file cabinets. See what you see. Generally, probably for me, a non-scientific survey is mostly what you find is shoes. because we've been collecting all these shoes, they're filling up our apartments and we have to put them in the file cabinet. I don't know. Lots of shoes and files from, you know, the old days, 1995, when we actually had files. So they don't have as much file space as they did before. And they also don't have as much support staff. And more important, they don't live in their offices anymore. So you talk to a lawyer today and you say, listen, is it still like it was in the 90s when you lived there 24 seven and you went there on a Saturday afternoon and everyone was there? And they'll say, no, it's empty on the weekends because they all have laptops. They're still working around the clock because God bless them, lawyers work. And they work all the time. But now they can work at home and they'd rather do that than come into the office. So they need space to have meetings. They need space to collaborate. They need to connect somewhere. They just don't need quite as much space for the stuff. This may be the look of the office of the future. Small floor plate, lots of windows, fun to go to, not the big IBM tower that we had before. The space is looking better than it ever looked before because you can afford it now. So my per square footage cost goes way up, right? If I'm renting space from someone, oh, it used to be $50 a foot, now it's $100 a foot. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Yeah, but I need less than half of what I used before. Less space more living, less space, more living. I want to take you back in time. We've seen this before. This huge transformation in our real estate environment that is occurring now, it is happening now, right under our noses. And real estate investors are starting to see where things could go because people are using space in a different way. And I, by the way, I didn't even talk about retail. I don't have enough time. But retail is completely transformed in ways that we can't even imagine. Maybe we're selling a seat. Maybe we're selling a club membership in an apartment. Maybe, you know, so you can change apartments every six months. I don't care as long as you stay in my apartment building or in my neighborhood or in my buildings. If I own buildings in multiple countries and you need to change where you live every six months, fine. You're in the club. The zip car of apartments, kind of an interesting idea. I don't know. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but I do know it is changing. And here's why I know it's changing. Back in 1450, give or take a year or two, back then they didn't keep the records the same way. A guy named Gutenberg said, you know what? I found a cheap way to make Bibles. This is a great technology. I'm gonna print these Bibles. Funny thing happened with those Bibles. It was just the beginning. 
We started printing books and more important, leaflets. You could cheaply print a single pager and you could nail it to the door of your local church. <laughs> the dark side to that, by the way, and we're all familiar with that, was 100, 150 years of brutal religious war throughout Europe. But on the plus side, <laughs> it changed the way we looked at the world, and it certainly changed real estate. Before that, there was no real estate business. The king owned the real estate, you know, and the rest of us had huts and carts, right? Then we wanted to read books, but in order to get the books, you had to store them somewhere dry, right? So you had to have a dry place to put it, so you had to create shops and warehouses. Not only that, you had to manufacture it, so you had to create factories to manufacture the paper in order to print it. And you needed to have stores, you needed to have retail, and lo and behold, you needed to have universities because people had to learn how to read in order to read the things that you had there. So you created university towns. Oh, and if you had a town, that meant you had to sell people stuff. So you suddenly had a civilization made up of towns, not just of kings. You had merchants, you had buildings, you had schools, you had offices, you had apartments, you had real estate. We were created by the printing press, those of us that live in real estate. Then a funny thing happened back in the 20th century. I know, way back when. Someone said, you know what? I can help our spies get information across to each other, and I can help our university researchers get some information back and forth through this ARPNET. It became the Internet. The Internet then was adopted for other things, including crazy people and sensing, you know, war, which I'm a little worried about. But also, the greatest period of literacy our globe has ever known. More people read than ever before. More people have access to every book ever written. More people are able to think and connect to other people than ever before. And more people want to live in cities. And more people need real estate to do what it should do for them. Our world looks like this now. It's an exciting time to be. And it's an exciting time to be in real estate because all of us are going to have less space and more life. Thank you.